Okay, now you can see there me. There you are. Great. Good evening. Good evening, so, Jasper. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to PACE's weekly live conversation series. Uh, my name is Jasper Sharp. I am the curator for modern and contemporary art at the Kunsthistorisches Museum here in Vienna. Uh, and the director of the philanthropic organization Phileas. I'm sitting here in my office in Vienna, speaking with the artist John Gerard, also in Vienna, but as you can see, he is sitting somewhere considerably more grand than uh, me. John, maybe you just begin by telling everyone where you are, this wonderful place. Uh, hi, Jasper. Uh, it is good to be here. Hello to everybody who is listening live on Instagram. Um, I'm in my studio, a new studio in Vienna, which is an old uh, carpenter's guild from the 19th century, mid 19th century, about 1850s. And um, I just moved in last week. And so the carpenters would show off by doing these kind of carvings. So it's this wonderful old space, which I'm working in. Amazing. So when they didn't have enough work to do, they would just sculpt the room they were living in. So fantastic. Uh, well, yeah. you've, I've got a massive inferiority complex just to begin this conversation. So uh, let's get going. For the next um, 45 minutes or so, we're going to run through three or four different works of yours over a period of about 15 years that are all somehow connected to each other. Um, okay. I thought we could begin with an early group of works of yours, the very first works of yours that actually that I ever saw in 2007 called The Smoke Trees. Maybe you could introduce these to everyone and just give a little bit of an understanding of how you came to this body of work in the first place. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this camera around. Right now, I'm trying to turn it around. Okay, so this is a work called Smoke Tree. And it is a really early work um, from around about 2005, 2006. And I wanted to begin with this because it's one of the first works I made which deals with subjects of smoke. And this is a tree which instead of producing leaves which would absorb oxygen, it is a tree that is producing carbon dioxide or smoke. Uh, so it's a kind of a polluter, a bit like we are polluters. But uh, so that is, there's, in total, there was five smoke trees. This is, this is one of them. And this is another one. And they all were based on uh, trees that were near my childhood home in, in Ireland. And John, what, what I yeah. think, kind of just to rewind, when I first did in front of these works, as a lot of people are doing now for the first time, I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at. I was mm -hmm. looking at something that was somehow from the world of film, somehow from the world of sculpture, somehow from the world of, of drawing. It sort of, I had no idea. So maybe you talk a little bit about the medium that you're working with to develop these works. Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to answer that by rewinding to a little bit of my own biography. Um, so first of all, I studied sculpture in, in the Ruskin school, um, part of its part of Oxford University, and I was an uh, undergraduate there, entering the university in 1994. So 1994 was uh, an interesting year, um, technically, because in a, in a funny way, you know, the internet, to my mind, became visible that year. Suddenly, you know, early browsers emerged. Um, and so I entered university as a sculptor that year, but very quickly said that I was particularly interested in computing as an artist. The Ruskin had one tiny little Mac about this size, it was early back. So I began to kind of attack that subject of the computing and sculpture. Uh, but jumping really fast forward, uh, post an MFA in Chicago, Art Institute of Chicago, I only really got my hands on the idea of like the virtual as a sculptural medium when I, when I went into a computer science MSc and then ended up in a residency in Ars Electronica in Austria. But uh, so I just wanted to kind of quickly rewind and give that arc. But to answer your question um, about, you know, what the smoke trees are, I suppose most basically they are a game engine. You know, it's a virtual world which you can look around um, and you build them in 3D by hand and then you bring them to life using 
the same technology that's, 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 that makes games. And they exist in the orbit of a 365 day year. There's night and day. Um, they, they are sort of their own contained worlds, as it were. Yeah, I'm just going to play it again as we, as we speak. Um, they are solar scenes. So the sun comes up on this scene, travels over and goes down. Uh, I describe them as orbital. Um, so the camera also travels around these works, typically at walk, walking pace in the later works. But because this is a world, a three-dimensional world, um, you can, it behaves differently than traditional cinema or traditional video. Um, you kind of, again, getting back to the idea of sculpture, this is a three-dimensional scene which you can look at and turn around as such. And John, how many, how many of these did you make? I made five smoke trees uh, and they kept me busy 2005, 2006, 2007. I was going to ask, they, uh, how long would each of them have taken you to make back then? A couple of months, each one a couple of months. And actually, when I was looking for online material to do with smoke, I found this picture, which leads us really to the next big work I think we're going to talk about. And just to... Just to Quickly, just talk about the production of your work at this early stage, 2006, 2007. Who are you working with? You have a modeler working with you. What, what's the team behind a work like this? Um, it is typically a core team of a modeler, 3D modeler, um, who will build, um, say, the tree trunk and branches by hand in 3D. Um, there's often a programmer um, of late in the last decade, it's been Helmut Bressler, who is here in Vienna with me. And I suppose one of the core um, individuals is a producer, in this case, Ver uh, Werner Putzelberger, who will kind of oversee the entire process and um, kind of craft this disparate element into one world. And then we publish it as a piece of software. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's an executable file in the end. Right. So yeah, maybe we'll move on, move on to that second work. Um, in 2009, a couple of years later, you and I did uh, a project together in Venice at the Biennale uh, on this wonderful island called Certosa in the, uh, in the lagoon, in an old, in a boat building warehouse. And we showed three works there. You presented three works, a pig production unit, uh, oil stick work, and this work, the dust storm. And it's this work mm -hmm. that I love to talk about because in many ways it follows on really nicely from the smoke trees, both in terms of the subject matter, but also the technology and the, the, the sort of the tricks and the, and the skill that you use to produce it. Could you, yeah. could you kind of explain the background of this work to everybody? Sure. So this is an image, uh, the image at the bottom of your screen is an image that I found, um, which is a dust storm part of the Dust Bowl, uh, April 14th, 1935. It's called Black Sunday, which was one of the most kind of chronic damaging dust storms of the Dust Bowl. And I became very interested in the Dust Bowl as a narrative. So I pursued that image all the way to University of Texas in Austin, found the image, turned it over, and written on the back was this phrase, which has really stuck with me, which is, Dust storm at Stratford, Texas, April 14th, 1935, 5.45 p.m., lasting 45 minutes. Darkest dark I ever experienced. And I became fascinated by this idea that, you know, through this ecological disaster that was the Dust Bowl, the public experienced a sort of a void of unimaginable darkness John, you know just the darkness for people that don't know what what actually caused dust storms what causes dust storms uh, this dust storm that you've seen in front of you i mean fundamentally this dust storm was created by petroleum because it was petroleum that powered the plows that plowed up 100 million acres of the midwest of america between post world war 1 between you know say 19, 1920 and 1930 and once the grass cover had been taken away, the dust could just blow. I mean, you have a drought cycle that still cycles on that landscape. That's not the cause of the dust bowl. Right. The dust bowl 
fuel was produced by a surge of energy from petroleum, uh, which was directed to the landscape and produced this extraordinary catastrophe, basically. So you found this image. What, what, what happens then? So this is me in Texas. At the bottom half of that picture, you can see Texas as it is now, Dalhart, Texas as it is now. And above is the historic storm, the black and white image of the storm from 1935. So I decided around about 2000, and I think I made this piece around about 2008, to try and unite the historic storm with the contemporary landscape. And what better medium to do that in than the virtual, than in simulation? So it became a work called Dust Storm Dalhart, Texas, which I'm going to jump to now. Oops. <laughs> That's a sneak peek of the next work. Let me just make this play. So it's very subtle. This is a recollection of the dust storm from 1935 on the landscape in Texas as it is now. And um, so if I, if I zoom this forward, you can see the storm. Like this is a video of the piece. This is not the simulation, but the camera orbits around, seeing the very flat panhandle landscape. And then you come back eventually to see this almost a social sculpture which sits on the landscape. And I'm, I remember the first time that I, I mean, I saw this several times in production in your studio, but when I saw it presented on this sort of epic scale in Venice for the first time, what really struck me, which I had absurdly never been fully aware of, is the fact that this storm never in fact reaches you. You're yeah. never engulfed in your work. You never experience that darkest dark. It's this pregnant, threatening presence of a storm, yeah. but it never actually reaches you. It's always on the yeah. verge. What was the yeah. decision? What was the decision in that to sort of keep it at bay, as it were? So I thought of the storm as a kind of my recreation of it was a sort of a social sculpture. Like for me in 2008, I felt that the historic narrative of the Dust Bowl was wrong. And actually somebody just in the comments mentioned that it was um, to do with overplanting. It was to do with overplanting, but the planting happened because of this extraordinary level of plowing, 100 million acres in, in 10 years. So I wanted to remember the storm as an oil catastrophe, like the Dust Bowl storm was a petroleum disaster. And I felt that it was a harbinger of the disasters to come, such as climate change. And so if I jump back to the storm, it sits, and I'll just zoom a little bit backwards here, it sits uh, on the landscape and it doesn't overwhelm you, but it is a signal or a sign for what is to come. And actually, in the last 10 years, you know, these disasters are coming, you know, the, um, you know, the, the dust storm has grown to global scale and become climate change. And that actually is a very nice lead into John, Western wait Flag. A Maybe I wait jump. a second on dust storm. What I think yeah. was really interesting, seeing this piece in Venice, for example, back in 2009, is that it was, it's on the time in the Midwest, it sets to the time in the Midwest where this event took place, where the yeah. event is taking place. So you would come into, the, into this building in Venice in the morning, in, in a Venetian morning, and it would be nighttime. Yeah. The storm would still be there as a, as a dark presence within the darkness. And it was only at about yeah. two o'clock or one o'clock in the afternoon in Venice that you would have sunrise in in the Midwest. And it was quite remarkable to realize that it had its own yeah. orbit unrelated to where we were. One thing I wanted, so, to, one thing I wanted to talk yeah. to you about is also just as someone who works in a museum of old master paintings, I know that you walked around the Kunsthistorische Museum a lot when you were first generating works like this to look at skies, these epic skies that people mm -hmm. painted. Is there something also of the, of the, of the Americans, of the Ansel Adams aesthetic that has found its way into a work like Dust Storm that you are conscious of? Um, well, I mean, one of the aspects of the virtual is that you are building in light. 
you are you are working in light. You're producing light effectively. So a lot of what you're producing is light hitting objects, producing image, and that is a sort of quite a fundamentally painterly process right. to produce a kind of a photorealistic simulation. I mean, I'm. Um, I look at everything. I've looked at all, you know, my, my heroes of, of, of art, you know, from, from Vermeer all the way through Ronnie Horn. You know, in a funny way, there's almost a sort of a crystalline precision to the work that I really like, you know, which linked in a way Ronnie Horn with someone like, um, you know, the earlier masters such as Vermeer. But I think one of the things about simulation, which I find in a weird way disappointing, is that it's, it's quite, it's missing. The virtual is kind of missing from contemporary art. And it has this extraordinary potential. I mean, I'm just going to, should I jump onto Western flag at this point? Yeah, to, sure. To, I mean, yeah. this is the, yeah, maybe I'll just introduce it quickly. This is a work from 2017. Um, it's seven or eight years after Dust Storm, but obviously there's a lot of the aesthetic and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the learning of Dust Storm that's fed into Western flag. Do you want to talk a little bit, maybe before we get into the work itself, about the, the, the commission that led to the creation of this work? Definitely, yeah. So Western Flag was commissioned by a TV station, by Channel 4 in the UK. They wanted to do something which would address Earth Day in 2017. And I worked very closely with um, John Hay, the commission arts editor, and Martin Donjon Chatillon, who was my dealer at that time. I'm a gallerist, and we sort of hatched this plan to um, to uh, try and make something that would sort of intrude on the public consciousness, in this case through TV. So we developed the idea, first of all, of a, um, of a TV intervention, and secondly, of um, this, well, I developed the idea of a smoke flag, which would... Um, take something that's invisible, carbon dioxide, and try and give it an image, in this case, a political image. Uh, and the site that, we, that I chose was um, the site of the very first oil strike in world history at Spindletop in Texas, first major oil strike, uh, the big, first really big one, which was in 1901 at Spindletop in Texas. And would you, for, I know that for many of the works that you've done, you've traveled to the actual site and documented it scrupulously with thousands of photographs and to, to, to build up this sort of virtual collage. Did you travel to Spindletop to, to document the landscape? And Yes. So with all of the works, um, they are effectively portraits. So I go and find this place and I produce a portrait of it by taking pictures of everything that's within it. I'll just swap back to the work for a second so you can see what I'm talking. So this is on the ground what Spindletop looks like now in Texas. It's, it's a post-oil environment. So it's a sort of a damaged post-oil environment. But it really looks like that. And we spend about a year rebuilding everything within it, again, as a portrait of itself within the virtual. And then it's augmented by this fictitious form, this smoke flag, which again, uh, the endeavor was to try give it, give carbon dioxide, which is a risk to society and to ecology, try to give it a political image. And what Channel 4 did was they cut it into TV with no announcement over 24 hours, a couple of times an hour. And I actually have that. Um, yeah, that that event. Of, yeah, I think you've got a little clip we can see. Yeah, so I'll jump to that. Um, so this has sound. So I'll press play and I'll make sure the sound is on. All right. And I'll just let it run. It takes 40 seconds. Back in North Devon, Emily, her builder Dave, and his team have been busy stripping out the kitchen, including the ceiling. The traditional lard and plaster. So that was the cut in. In silence. Is one period feature. And then back to normal. The test of time. Back to normal this. programming. I mean, it's extremely eerie, I have to say. Uh, just with no announcement, just um, p 
this kind of short burst just punctuating a home improvement uh, program. I think it was shocking for people. Yeah. I mean, it was also, John, it was also around the time that, you know, black flags were being raised in the caliphate in the Middle East, you know? Well, I mean, Channel 4 had to really talk to Ofcom, the, uh, you know, the British Broadcasting uh, you know, Commission about that, you know, because it is a threatening symbol and it was going to cut into Channel 4 with no announcement um, a couple of times an hour. And, you know, Twitter just sort of lit up after it came on. People were like, what just happened on Channel 4? It's and I really wanted that, you know, I mean, in the context of COVID-19, you know, which is an interruption and a pause, it's an interesting analogy to make because I wanted to um, force people out of their comfort watching a home decorating show suddenly they lose their entertainment. And it's this thing they have never seen before, this, this political image, a, a flag, which has become something else. John, and the other aspect, which was really important, and I'm just going to jump back to show it to you, um, was Somerset House, where we put up, uh, working with Thomas Dane Gallery, we put up an a, a, a LED wall in Somerset House, which was there for a week which you can see here in this image. And that would be shown day and night. Uh, people could walk into the courtyard of Somerset House and they were confronted with this enormous LED wall. Yeah, yeah. So it was in, um, it was in Somerset House for a week. It was on TV for a day. And it was also live streamed to uh, YouTube for a month, which was actually the most powerful, one of the most powerful things we did was the live stream. because. Western flag became almost a meme. People took it from the live stream and took ownership of it. Right. And they, um, they made it their own. John, one thing I wanted to ask you about, just, I mean, we could talk about it in, in, in relation to any of these works, but we'll do it while we're on um, Western flag. I remember the first time I saw your work and I thought, okay, what on earth am I looking at? There's, it draws from the world of, uh, of film, very obviously, because it's, it's moving. It's drawing from the world of photography because while it's moving, it's a frozen moment. The weather yep. is the weather that you documented on that day in that place. Never change, it doesn't start snowing or raining. I think it draws yep. on the medium of drawing because you have literally meticulously recreated this. It draws on the medium of painting because of what you've addressed as the very painterly aesthetic. It's sucking mm. in and drawing on all these different media. And yet, what we're left with is something that a lot of people, if they just breeze past this in an art fair or somewhere, something that feels very much like film, sort of video film. Yeah. What, when we saw the smoke trees at the beginning of this conversation, they were works that visitors or viewers or the owners of the work would manipulate themselves to change the orbit and so on. At a certain point, you remove that ability for the viewer to manipulate it themselves and you put in motion a very slow sort of mesmeric orbit to the works, which is something that's now remained in the work. Can you talk a little bit about that shift from control in the hands of the viewer to, yeah. to control in your hands? Well, in a funny way, you know, as, as you have said, the first virtual works, people could grab them and look around them. And then that was lost. I let go of that. And the reason I let go of that was I began to see technology, particularly simulation, really controlling the world in, in a way that was invisible to a broader public. And by that, I mean the modeling of reality by investment banks, by governments, by um, the military. And decisions are made on the basis of these models which then affect the real, but this is occurring um, in these algorithmic spaces, which are, I think are broadly invisible to the, to the public. So I, I kind of removed that ability to control the work because I felt that technology was galloping in the, let's just say the black box space of society. And it was becoming something very powerful very quickly. And the public didn't have their hands on it. 
And, um, and so I, I released that ability. You know, if I, that, 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 you know, if I jump back to look at Somerset House again, here you have an LED. Well, if I, if I do, here you have an LED. Here you have the public. The LED is showing a simulation that's unfolding over a year, but you don't stop it. You can't control it. You could if you had a controller, but you don't control it. Right. And I think that had to do with my relationship to what I describe as black box computing. Right. And the great thing, obviously, about seeing a work installed in public space like that is added to film, photography, drawing, painting, you suddenly have sculpture and you suddenly have, oh. you suddenly have the performative element as well, because uh, not only is your work itself performative, but suddenly you bring, you bring the relationship of, of the figure and the, and, and the viewer into, into direct dialogue with the work. Do you, Absolutely. Do you want to maybe talk about the, the, the next public iteration of this work, which was actually just last year here at, at Desert X in the, um, in the Coachella Valley in, in Southern California? How, how, did, how did the presentation of this work in a completely different, you know, barren, wild landscape, how did this work read for you there compared to the, the urban, urban version of it? So uh, that is a good, very interesting uh, question. Um, really, with Desert X in, in Palm Springs, the, the Western flag kind of went west, you know? It went to, to the California, you know, to the land of dreams, to California. And also, California with that kind of strange um, extremes, the extremes of, of California, where on the one hand, you know, you've got extraordinary problems with water. And on the other hand, you know, futures are being invented there, you know? you know, be it Tesla or, you know, even Google or all these sort of, you know, these companies that are emerging in that, have emerged in that part of the world. But the, so um, working with Desert X, um, we placed an LED wall in the American landscape, in the landscape of the West of America. And um, it completely transformed it because here you have atmospherics, you know, here you have the sun coming down. Here you have, you know, the rain and the wind. I mean, it was an extraordinary thing to do. And this picture, you see the kind of sculptural component of the work. Um, can people still hear me? Yeah, Somebody yeah. says they can. You're great. You're great. Okay. Um, so really, to put the work into the landscape was uh, it, it was an extraordinary opportunity, I have to say. And it, it kind of brought out some of the sort of more sublime components of the work, I suppose you could say. Um, and it, 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 it also brought this subject of carbon dioxide really to the American landscape from, you know, Britain, for instance. Right. And did it appear any less threatening there? I mean, I think the Channel 4 sort of guerrilla interruption is about the most threatening version of this work. But did it, did it, did it feel very sinister there on the landscape and very sort of ominous? Um, or did it, it have a sort of beauty to it sudden, all of a sudden? Or... Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think this brings us to this idea of, of the public domain because this was a wall, the principal audience for it was from the highway. You know, the highway coming into Palm Springs, and this was in the desert beside the highway. And um, what was beautiful for me is that people pulled off the highway, families, you know, people who were working in Palm Springs, who really would be unlikely to enter an art museum, I think. You know, let's just say ordinary people, working people, pulled off the highway, walked up to this thing, and were like, what is this? What is this? You know, it has no frame. It looks like you've cut a hole in the scene, right. basically. I mean, what, what, sort of, what sort of information was someone getting if they were getting out the of the title? Car? The title. The title was there on a sign from Desert X. Um, and, but I saw kids kind of saying to their parents, like, you know, what is this? And so I would say if I was to make a statement as part of this uh, Instagram Live for Pace, I would say that I am, my commitment is to the public domain, you know, is to put simulations into the public domain. Because there you have collisions with kids, with such broad publics, 
And I love that. It's so motivating for me. John, this is something I'd like to explore a little bit for the next chapter of, the, of this conversation. We, we're living in a very, very, very strange moment in the world. And yeah. a lot of people in our world, in the art world, are thinking about how we are going to reemerge into the world post lockdown. And a lot of the ideas that are being floated do surround notions of public art. Because if we can no longer cram 400 people into a gallery uh, yeah. and, and, do, and do large gatherings, at least for the next few months, why don't we begin bringing people, why don't we bring art to people, art into public yeah. space? And there've been a lot of interesting articles and interviews and, and ideas floated in, in the last couple of weeks about this. And it's something that's definitely gaining momentum. And I think it's a very yeah. good thing for us all to be thinking about. What is it, I mean, you've shown a number of works in public space recently, Solar Reserve, you showed outside the Lincoln Center in New York, you showed it at LACMA. What is it about your work in particular that you think lends itself so well to this context? Because film and video, for example, has not thrived necessarily in, in public art over, over, over the years. We get more used to seeing it in, in galleries and museums. What, what, why do you think people have been approaching you to, to, to mount these large LED screens with your work on it? That is, um, that is something that I have been thinking about a lot. Um, so I would say that I am producing worlds. I'm producing simulated worlds. They may look a bit like a film or like a video, but actually they come from a completely different history. They come from a history of military simulation, like flight simulation, battlefield simulation. They have very little to do with film. Right. And for some reason, and I'm actually just going to swap back around and talk over it because I think it's, it's nice to see this when I'm speaking. But for some reason, these worlds are cutting into the world. They're forcing themselves into the world in this way, which video and film are not. And I think it has to do the fact that it's a, this is world making. And as somebody has just said in the comments, they're portals. But they're portals which have a soul, you know, it's a narrative, but a different kind of narrative than you get in film. You know, it's one story, in this case of a flag, which is made of smoke, which is very specific to the medium. But then this flag is in a solar orbit of a year. You know, so if you came across this scene in, 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 in um, in, uh, in, in Palm Springs at night. It is nighttime, it's dark. Right. And somehow, I, I, can't, I think critically you can do a better job of this than I can, but somehow these virtual worlds, these simulations are cutting a place in the world for themselves that's different from film. Right. And actually that very organically leads us, if you want. I mean, John, that's, I mean, go com away. coming back to the slightly old fashioned world that I inhabit at the Kunsthistorisches, it's no different than the idea of putting a painting on a wall for people in the 16th century. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's taking a lot of that, you know, it's taking a lot of that very basic gesture. Um, yeah. And the frameless quality is also part of what I think makes this so, so remarkable. Let's move on. Um, let's move on from Western flag to two new works that nobody has seen yet which you are preparing. And uh, we can give people a little sneak preview. One of the works, two of the works are gonna be shown later this year at the Galway International Arts Festival in Ireland. And one of them is then gonna go on next year in 2021 to the uh, Biennale in Guangzhou in South Korea. Maybe you could just introduce these two works because they're very connected and they also keep us in public space for the time being. So this is a sneak preview, just only for you guys and our, our listeners. But um, so I've worked for the last couple of years on a project which is called Mirror Pavilion. And I'm going to show you a render of that Mirror Pavilion. So this is a mirror polished metal. And we put this object, this cube into the landscape in Ireland, in this case in Galway as you said, Jasper, for Galway International Arts Festival, but part of what's called Galway 2020, which is the European capital of culture in 2020. But if you walk up to this cube, you see the landscape on three sides and you see yourself as a consumer of art as such. 
And then on the front is this weird memory, this folk memory of uh, a leaf covered figure, a green woman. I, they're called green men, but I call them green women because um, in my work, it is actually a green woman. And this figure um, is performing, it's a simulation derived from motion capture and um, it performs a lament for a heating world. So let me just move forward and show you this. So this is the character, the leaf covered figure who is lamenting, she's grieving for a heating world. And this performance is produced by a dancer, Fanola Cronin, mm -hmm. who is um, performing here, as you can see. And that suit that she's wearing is sending the information back to the simulation and producing this work eventually. So this is part one, which is the leaf covered figure. Uh, and part two is a different figure, which is a straw covered figure. They're all objects from folk memory. From, this, is, from this is a historical photograph we're looking at. Yeah. This is from in the collection of Galway University. Um, and these are figures covered in straw. And I'm interested in these figures because they are humans embedded in a food landscape. And I'm fascinated by what that means. Why submerge yourself in, in, in a food landscape? Straw are our leaves as such. And, and John, uh, sorry, I mean, the leaf covered figure is something that more, more people will be familiar with from sort of I, I have a sort of pagan association in my mind immediately with the leaf covered figure. Tell me about the straw covered figures. I mean, what, what, were, they, what were they to symbolize? Was it something to do with the solstices or the seasons? Or? It's, these are farmers and they are becoming anonymous. They're losing their human identity and they are uh, wearing what is really a symbol for the sun, straw in folk knowledge is a symbol for the sun it's a sun symbol and if you see the tops of their hats are four pointed they're, f they're woven into four points which is symbolic of the four seasons of the year so i don't fully understand what the straw boys were doing but when, I when, believe... when did they make an appearance well this is photographed in the 1950s but i mean what time, but... what time of year i mean probably in the summer i guess oh. Well, no, I mean, any time of the year, because straw is stored right. all year. But they would turn up at weddings and be badly behaved and steal the bride. But they would, um, I think fundamentally they are to do with fertility, but they're to do with an exchange with the landscape. But let me jump to the next thing, because this is really important. So here we have remade the straw figure. In 2019, this is in Dublin with a group of people who made this piece with me. And here you can see, and this is a peek into the finished work. This is motion capture from a wonderful dancer called Ursula Robb, transferred to a virtual figure, this, this uh, corn figure. And she is performing a solar wheel, which is a very old symbol for the sun. And all of this will be placed on a pair of LED walls and a pair of um, mirror polished pavilions opening in 2020 in Ireland. So it's the next really big project, which is coming up. I'm going to come back to me. Amazing. It's got something. It's uh, but it is true. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I know another one of your great heroes is Bruce Nauman. And I, yeah, yeah. I feel him traipsing through his studio, mapping the studio. Uh, the, the Bruce Nauman. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and John, and, and uh, it's, the, it's the latter of those two works which is going to travel on to, to Guangzhou, to South Korea. Corn work, which is the piece involving the straw figures, will go to the Guangzhou Biennale, um, which is uh, now rescheduled for early 2021. Natasha Ginwala and Daphne Ayas curating. Right. Yeah, no, we're looking forward to that very much. And, and Phileas, that I, that I helped run is, is very proud to be a co-producer of that work. So thrilled to see that. John, it's, we've, we've hit the 40 minute mark. We've, we've got about five more minutes of people's, people's love and attention. Um, okay. Before we go, I think we can't, we can't leave without talking a little bit about the very strange situation that the world 
finds itself in at the moment. Um, it's, it's one of those very rare moments in our lifetimes where just about everything changes. And we don't know whether it's changed forever or it's changed temporarily, but I noticed that quite a few of the things that I've been looking at over the last months, listening to, reading, watching, suddenly, all of a sudden, from one day to another, appeared to me to be completely and utterly irrelevant. And other things, art, music, books, poems, came rushing forward and felt urgent and vital and necessary. And your work very much falls into that latter category for me. How, how, how are you dealing with everything? How are you processing everything that's going on? How is it changing your working process? And how, you know, the, the $6 million question, how do you anticipate that, that you and all of us are gonna reemerge into this post, post lockdown world? So, first of all, um, I have not been in the same place for this long in 20 years. I have not been in one place. I've been working in my studio for eight weeks. And if you work as a contemporary artist now, uh, you are in a global conversation. It just is part of the of the. Um, you are invited, I mean, it's a privilege and it's a wonderful thing, but to show in Guangzhou, Pierre Huig did an extraordinary project in Japan, um, in Okayama last year. You know, it is incredible to go there. And suddenly, it all stops. So I am um, shocked. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm profoundly shocked. I'm, I think I am a little bit in shock. And yet, um, you know, acknowledging some privilege because, you know, I obviously have representation with Pace and with Thomas Dane and I have resources that I can draw on, but it is powerful to stop and to feel and to think because we can throw away a lot of concerns by traveling. You know, when I'm packing, I'm thinking about packing. When I'm turning up at an opening, that's what I'm thinking about. So I have to think and feel here. And it's been hard, you know. I think hypermobility is um, maybe a little addictive. So that's stopped. Um, as to what's going to happen next, I mean, I'm, um, I'm, I'm pretty worried, you know. I think this is a big, you know, sea change in the full sense of that word. And I just am trying to prepare myself for that sea change. And, and what about some silver linings of the situation? I mean, the chance to spend a, 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 a sustained period of time with your team. I know you yeah. sort of went into, went into quarantine together with your, your modeler and your producer, so you were able to keep working. I mean, yeah. surely there have been some, in terms of the, the, the preparation for future works. I know there's a couple of other works in the pipeline and there must have been some silver linings in terms of the, 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 the quality of time you've been able to put together over the last few weeks and months. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're finishing a monster of a work, corn work you've just seen is four seasons, four characters, four performances. I mean, we've been working on it for years. That's been a gift. Um, I think that, uh, that is a silver lining for me, but I must think more broadly socially. And I am worried for those who are working very directly, you know, for, for in restaurants for tips and such things. I'm just, I'm, you know, I, I just, I'm, I, I just can't get away from this. From, I, I'm, you know, I, I, you know, it's scary. It's, I, I personally cannot not admit to being fearful right now. And I carried through on these commissions for the time being. September is an unknown, you know. And all my exhibitions are cancelled. Everything, everything, you know, everything's postponed and cancelled. So it's a strange, well, very weird time. It's been a strange time for all of us. We've been cutting our own hair or, or having our hair cut for us by very non-professional. Uh, I have a little snip on, on my ear uh, to, to, to uh, attest to that uh, from my dear wife. Um, but uh, no, it's been a strange time and all we can do is 
I, I, have a, I have a strange confidence in this situation. I think it's shown the strength of a great deal of things. It's exposed all sorts of fault lines politically uh, and, and, and socially. And it's very much split society in, in ways that are deeply unfortunate. Having said that, I have seen great things in people and in systems and in structures. And I have a feeling that if we can get through this, we're going to come out the other end you know, we need, to, we need to support every single restaurant, coffee shop, uh, everything we can possibly keep alive. We need to keep with us for the journey. But I, 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 have, a, I have a strange confidence. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to play the confident card. But I, I know you do as well. We would be strange not to be fearful because it would be irresponsible almost not to be fearful. But I, I, I feel there are, there, are, there are good things if we, can, if we can hang in there and ride out the storm. Yes. Um, so, John, yeah, it's been it. It's been, a, it's always a total pleasure to talk to you. I miss you. I look forward to see you. We, we normally have scrambled eggs about every three weeks somewhere in a coffee house in Vienna. And I'm, I'm looking forward to do that again sometime soon. Um, That's been, I haven't seen you in two months. I know you are one of the people that makes, uh, makes all of this worthwhile. Um, so thank you. Keep going. We need you. We miss you. Uh, you're a great artist. And I would say thank you to Pace for giving us this platform this evening. And uh, yeah. we wish everyone who, who listened in all the best. Stay safe. Yeah. Be well. Be healthy. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you again very soon. Thank you, everybody. So nice you came and joined us. Thanks, John. All the best. Bye.